Hey, welcome to the I Heart Guitar Podcast, and a massive thanks to everybody who's been listening and downloading and all that stuff. Um, the traffic on this thing has really jumped in the last few weeks, and you know it's it's really exciting. It's made my day. It's made my week. It's made my month. Um, the Steve I episode went off. The uh, Devin Townsend episode's been very popular. Duff McKagan. Um, we also had a, an extra little episode last week with Christian Martucci talking about his um, BC Rich that he's hoping to get back. So there's been some fun stuff there, and uh, you know, dig back, see see what else uh, I've covered on the podcast so far. I've had some really cool guests, um, and there are more to come. Uh, this week's guest is Tal Wilkenfeld, the bass genius who. Um, her album uh, Love Remains came out a few months ago and we did this interview uh, a few weeks after the record came out. Um, it's really spectacular. It's a very um, songwritery album. There's some great playing in there, but like the songs themselves are really, you know, very deep and very, um, very realised, you know? It's a it's one of those albums that once you let it get, get its hooks into you, you're kind of stuck in it for a, a week or so. Um, so that is this week's episode, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, don't forget to, you know, like, subscribe, um, support the Patreon if you can. That would help me out a bunch, because um, living as a freelancer ain't so easy. <laughs> and um, I'm really hoping to get the new uh, Rode, uh, R-O-D-E, um, uh, Rodecaster Pro podcast set up. Um, if I can get me one of those, it will allow me to um, really, you know, improve the sound quality of this thing and all sorts of stuff. It'll um, uh, allow me to record phone interviews directly into the recorder instead of the way I do it now, which is just on speakerphone. And lots of cool stuff that would be good for the podcast. So if you can subscribe to the podcast um, Patreon, you'll help me to make the thing better. <laughs> anyway, here we go with Tal Wilkenfeld. Yeah, so I am so excited about this record. Like, I've always known that you've been capable of much more than just being a bass legend. <laughs> but um, there is so much depth to this. Um, I was wondering, it must have... Um, how long have you been sitting on these songs? Uh, well, I recorded Quarter Painter in 2013. Mm. And that was the first time I... I tried working with this uh, group of musicians, Blake Mills and Ben Montench and Jeremy Stacy, Paul Stacy is the producer, and Zach Ray, my keyboard. And um, yeah, that's when I, I decided uh, that I wanted to work on uh, the rest of the songs and go back in with the same band. Yeah. Um... The process started in 2013. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I mean I bet you're kind of like me in that the first thing you did when you picked up an instrument was not try and you know shred it was to try and write a song you know exactly that was yeah the very first thing I did yeah um what were those early songs like oh um <laughs> Probably the equivalent of, of um, yummy, yummy. I got love in my tummy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember my first. I was about eight years old, and I picked up an acoustic guitar and. I kind of knew how to hold down chord shapes but I didn't know how to tune it so it sounded just terrible <laughs> and my first song was called No Food, No Freedom and it was about the starving kids in Africa because I was a very soulful 8 year old <laughs> aww <laughs> um, that's amazing you can remember that yeah I've still got the lyrics written down somewhere in a book at mum and dad's <laughs> that's funny yeah um so, yeah, I, I'm just really intrigued by the, the kind of variety and the, the liveliness of this record. Like, it really feels... I mean, did you record this, you know, more or less live? Because it, it really has that kind of dynamic feel. Yeah, the whole thing was live. Um, so we recorded at East West Studios in, uh, on Sunset Boulevard. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, it, was, it was a pretty short process, actually. Like, the whole record was really done over, over I think it was eight to ten day period. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were just big gaps between, like, uh, doing the first session and then doing the, the second session and then, you know, and then doing... I did strings and woodwinds in, in England and then mixing it and then mastering it. You know, because I did, I, I did the record independently. Mm. And, uh, and then it took some time to find the right partner to release the album. And uh, it was quite a process uh, that's been taking quite a while. So I'm, I feel pretty relieved to, to have it all out there finally. Yeah. Did you um, play any of this stuff publicly before you recorded it? Was was maybe the only one that I played live. Yeah, I think. <laughs> cool. Um, so, are you? Um, yeah, are you taking this on the road? Um, you know, as a full band, or is this something that you would I don't know do with an acoustic guitar, or what kind of format is this going to take in terms of a live entity? music quite a bit already yeah um we spent 2016 opening for the who and uh we've gone to japan uh we've played the west coast the east coast played canada so yeah we've, we've already played it uh in quite a few places but not so much since the album's actually come out so mm. kind of set in a reverse order a little bit but I do hope to go to Europe and Australia. Uh, I want to hit Japan again. Uh, I'd like to go to India and Africa. I'd like to go to Brazil. I mean, there's, there's so many places I'd like to go, and so it's just a matter of figuring it all out. Hmm. Um. I've got to tell you, your vocals on "Hard to Be Alone." My God, you're tapping into something there. <laughs> Um, being human is an interesting phenomenon. (laughs) It really is. You know, sometimes you hear something where it's just like, you know, the, you know, they're really feeling that they're not just kind of reciting it, you know? And, um, yeah, there are some notes you hit towards the end in particular that are just so affecting and yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I heard a story about about uh, John Lennon singing. Uh, I can't remember which song it was, but I think I, I remember hearing that he went completely hoarse after doing one take. Of, uh, what, it was one of his screaming songs. Yeah. But um, I was I definitely went in in that mode. Like I don't care if I if I lose my voice, I'm just gonna go for it. <laughs> there was nothing in reserve. Yeah, man, it works. <laughs> um... So, um, before I hit record on this, I mentioned that I'm a comedy nerd and I see you, you know, on Instagram all the time at comedy shows and stuff. What's your, what's your kind of, you know, relationship to comedy? Well, um, I don't know. I mean, I was touring with The Who in 2016, uh, after I made the album and then towards the end of that year, I, I started I was losing a lot of friends, and uh, I lost about 20 friends in a really short period of time, and I also Ooh. lost my grandparents, who, um, you know, were very uh, prominent in my life, mm. and uh, and so I I, um, I needed to take a break from just the, the music scene, and uh one of my friends suggested I go and see some live comedy. I think it was his way of trying to cheer me up. Mm. And and he, he took me in. And after after going one time, I was already hooked. Yeah. You know, I was like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And how do I not know about live stand-up comedy? Like, how, how do I not know? I mean, I, I when I was younger I used to be obsessed with Monty Python and mm. The Simpsons so I definitely loved 
to laugh, but I, for whatever reason, just, I was, I, I had a pretty sheltered upbringing. I just never even knew uh, there was such big as death of comedy. <laughs> so, um, I mean, but you're talking to the same person that also didn't know who Mick Jagger was. <laughs> like, I was just really, like, had such a sheltered upbringing. But yeah. um, anyway, so, yeah, so comedy became sort of medicine for me during this period of intense grief. And also it was a way for me to stay in touch with my creative side while still keeping, you know, enough of a distance from from the direct music scene. Like, I really needed to break from it. Mm. Yeah. I love going to... The... Music, musicians and comedians are very similar. Yeah, definitely. Similar yeah. in lifestyle, similar uh, in the way that, like, we observe things and uh, create things. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I know for me, every time I go to LA for NAM, I always book a few extra days so I can just hang out at the comedy store. And, um, you know, I've made so many friends there and stuff, you know, like I mentioned, Earl Skakel as a buddy and, you know, Eleanor Kerrigan and I knew Brody Stevens. I missed that guy. And yeah, like it always felt like family every, well, it feels like family every time I go there. There's always someone I, you know, I know and can just, you know, pick the brain off or just chat about whatever. And, you know, it's just, yeah, there's something about the LA scene in particular that just, it, it feels like home to me, even though I'm yeah. not funny at all. <laughs> There's also a really great scene in New York. Like, uh, I love going to the Comedy Cellar and... Um there's New York, like there's, there's really quite a few places in New York that are really fun as well. Mm. But LA, there's a bit more space and like room, like at the comedy store or the improv. Um, there's, there's more room to like to hang out and, and have you know quality conversations. Whereas in New York, it's pretty pretty jam packed in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so back to music. Um, what's your kind of, I guess relationship to your voice like you sound like a very confident singer um and usually you know usually when someone's really good at something you know the other things are kind of not up to the level like but you're singing like if you weren't a bass legend <laughs> you, you know you could really hold your own as a as a vocalist without ever having touched a bass i think thank you that that's a really nice compliment it's nice to hear you're welcome. So, what's yeah? What's your kind of um, what's your kind of relationship to to your voice? Um, well, voice is very different to to playing an instrument because, like, you know, in order to sing through an instrument, you have to sort of break through uh, a technical barrier, and you have to in in order to just uh, be, have it be pure expression. And whereas the voice, like, you know, anybody can sing. Like, they just open their mouths and sing. I mean, it's, it's another thing uh, to, as to whether or not they can hold a, hold a tune or whatever. But, you know, anybody can physically sing. Mm. So uh, I think it's more about just becoming comfortable with what your voice actually sounds like. Um, and then... And then more importantly, like, what do you want to say? Like, what do you want to talk about? Because you sing, tell stories. I mean, you play, you play an instrument to tell stories too. Although a lot of musicians um, get caught up in the, the technical stuff and, and forget that. So while there are other musicians that are really tuned into that, into like telling a story with their instrument. And so it's the same with the voice. It's like, what do you want to say? And, um, uh, that's what takes time. Mm. Is, uh, is is really getting into to, to lyric writing. You know, I've spent quite a lot of time reading poetry and and uh, and writing, and just really wanting to uh, tell stories that will resonate with people. And um, yeah, so it's been, it's been really enjoyable for me. Mm. Yeah, and I guess in a way, you know, it's kind of like comedy. You've got to craft the words exactly, <laughs> you know. And then you also got to be ready to to turn on a dime. Yeah. 
I know for me, my singing, like I'll never be a great singer, but, uh, I'm 40. Like I just turned 40 a little while ago and I'm finally happy with my voice and where it's at and it does what I want it to. And yeah, it'll never be great, but it's, it's me. Like, let the idea of it being great or not great go. Maybe it actually would be, because it's just about, I think, singing, or actually anything in life, is just about being really comfortable in your own skin. Mm. And uh, then that's when your individuality really shines through. Like, I know that Jimi Hendrix never thought of himself as a good vocalist, but... Mm. He happens to be one of my favorite vocalists because he's just purely emoting and, and storytelling. Or Bob Dylan or, or Leonard Cohen. Like, these are some of my favorite vocalists, but if you go to, like, a vocal teacher, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you that <laughs> they might tell you something different. But, but I just want to hear people tell me a story. Mm. I'll yeah. tell me a story. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, we should probably talk about gear while I've got you for a couple more minutes. Um, what did you use on the record? Um, I used a, I used Jackson Brown's P bass because yeah. I didn't have my P bass yet. I used uh, a vintage harmony bass. I used a fifties Epiphone guitar. One thing after another. I used my Sadowski five string. Strung E to high C on Haunted Love with a capo. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used an old J45, I think, on Pieces of Me, and uh, another kind of Gibson acoustic on Love Remain. That's about it. Yeah. I kind of got to a point where I, I feel like the gear question isn't as, in, like, the what you used isn't as important a question as why did you use it. Yeah, and the why is really hard to articulate. You know, you, you you really, when you get into a room with musicians who are all playing live, you you pick up an instrument and you hear how that sounds with all the instruments that they've picked up. You know, I mean, Jeremy Stacey brought maybe like three or four drum kits mm. and he was switching drum kits all the time. Blake brought maybe like 10 to 15 guitars. So you, we all try things and... Maybe we'd make an adjustment, uh, like, oh, the P-Bass doesn't sound right here, or change the snare, or, or change the guitar. And so it's really just everyone adjusting to each other in the same way that in the arrangements of the songs we were adjusting to each other. Like, what what Jeremy came up with was influencing me, which is influencing Blake, and then he would influence... Like, everyone was influencing each other in real time, and that's why I really, really appreciate... Uh, the process of recording as a live ensemble as opposed to layering things on a record. Although, I have infinite respect uh, for records that are made that way too, and, and those come out great. It's just a different sound. It just depends on what sound you're going for. Like, I really wanted that interactive live sound, and I wanted everyone to be influencing each other. Um, but, like, I was to other records that are made. In, in the other way and and they're amazing you know as mm. well it's just, it's, uh, I might do a record like that one day yeah so cool that's not what I was feeling for this record yeah cool well that looks like our time up so thanks so much for the chat it's been really fun and I love the record and I'm sure I'll bump into you at the store or the improv or lago or something someday yeah great cool well I'll catch you around thanks very much Cheers. Bye.